a ruthless politician, and he was a ruthless general. Until finally, a final showdown occurred because Mark Antony had become involved with the uh, descendant of one of the four generals that had taken the lands conquered by the Greek Empire under Alexander the Great, and her name was Cleopatra. And they, being involved in a torrid love affair, conspired against Octavius, and he, in a military campaign, put down the armies of Egypt until he stood as the only strong man left. And his word to the people in Rome as they faced the Senate, he was going to make Rome great again. That was actually what he said. Great again. And as he pledged to make Rome great, he fulfilled all of his promises ruthlessly. And the nation now acclaimed him as the supreme leader. From his grandfather, Julius Caesar, he took the name Caesar. And then as the Senate tried to decide what to call him as the last standing strong man of the militaries of the legions, they first suggested calling him the king of Rome. And that was not acceptable to him. So they said, we'll call you the dictator of Rome, more accurately portraying the fact that you will be in absolute control. And he scoffed at that and refused. And then the Senate came up with the name that he found acceptable, Augustus, being Latin for a deity, to be equal with the gods. And from that point forward, he was known as Caesar Augustus, Caesar, equal with the gods. The entire world had been subjugated. The temple that was open for the worship of the god of war in the Roman Empire was only open when a military campaign was underway. And the rest of the time, the temple gates were shut and people were not allowed inside. Because of the iron-fisted rule, Rome had peace for over 16 years. The difficulty was it had also been crushed, and everything that Rome touched was crushed. As I alluded, alluded to earlier, the world in which Mary and Joseph lived was one where there was an iron fist around the throat of Israel, where Taxation, depending on how much you had to transport for road taxes and things, could be up to 90% where the people were hungry, where the people were second-class citizens in their own city. This was the absolute strong man, and when he spoke, things happened. And sitting on the throne every 14 years, the new Augustus would set the timing of the day when he would snap his fingers and all the world would go to the cities of their birth to be enrolled so that they knew that their taxes were paid. And Mary and Joseph were caught in this. Mary was nine months pregnant. You know all the pictures we see of the stable where there's the sheep and the cow and the little donkey? Well, there might have been those things, but there was no donkey on the road. The scripture no place records that Mary had a ride on her trip. There's a great deal of aloneness that's suggested in the text as we read on. Mary is in a strange place because as you read Matthew, you get Joseph's lineage, and he was of the house of David. And as we read the lineage of, of uh, Mary, she was also a descendant of David. 
And they both had to return to Bethlehem in order to be counted. They were in a stable. Mary didn't have what most, most Jewish girls counted on. Her mother was not there when the child was born. There was no midwife. Significant women in her life did not surround her to help this 16, 17-year-old girl as she brought forth this very strangely conceived child. Second verse. This census first took place in Quirinius was governing, when Quirinius was governing Syria. So went all to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called, wow, just like the scripture said, Bethlehem. Now, when you have trouble in your life and you think that everything has gone wrong and that's why you're winding up in the circumstance you're in, God had something to accomplish. Jesus had to be, ordered, had to be born in Bethlehem. And the circumstances that brought it out were sure and certain because not to obey the emperor had dire consequences. Think about this. The whole world is responding to a strong man and he firmly believes himself to be equal with a deity and in absolute control when in truth he was nothing more than a puppet of almighty God for his purposes. I've said this here before and I say it again. Even the devil is God's unwilling servant. That's a fact. Everything that concerns our lives and everything that we face, all the trouble that seems to be so dire, God is absolutely omnipotent. And the fact of the matter is, he holds us right in the palm of his hand for his purpose. Nothing can happen to a believer that is not within the purview of God. Nothing. And he says to us, cast your cares on him because he cares for you. And everything by prayer and petition, make known to God what you have need of. He loves you. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her, first, her firstborn son. Now catch this subtly. It says she, the action is by Mary, wrapped him in swaddling clothes. No midwife, no female relative to help and to care for the child as she's just delivered and laid him in a manger. Okay, translation, feed trough. Because there was no room for them at the end. Now, if there was ever a time for Mary to be discouraged, if there was ever a time for the devil to be playing on Joseph's mind saying, you don't really know where this child came from. You don't know what the circumstance is really all about. Your relatives are murmuring behind your back. Others are talking about what really happened. How are you going to take care of this child? The scripture says that Joseph was a carpenter. Jesus became a carpenter. The actual word that's used is tecton. A tecton is a hand worker. You know what they were? Laborers. They did what came along. They did what they had to do to get by. These were not rich people. And behold, an angel of the Lord. Oh, I'm sorry. Now, there was in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock at night. Now, this is an area of huge controversy. The reason it is is because most people on this side of the world don't realize that it snows in Israel in the winter. And it is bitterly cold. And it would be highly unusual 
for shepherds to be out with flocks on December 25th. Was Jesus born on December 25th or was it later in the year? Many believe that he was born much later in the year in the spring. The fact of the matter is, it is not recorded and we're not sure. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, do not be afraid for behold, I bring you good tidings with great joy which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior. The name Jesus is the Greek rendering of the Hebrew Yahshua, Yeshua, which we translate in English, Joshua. It is a compound word that comes from two Hebrew words. The first part is Jehovah. The second part is saves. So if you're named Joshua, your name means Jehovah saves. <laughs> and this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was, the, was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace and goodwill toward men. I can imagine that scene. You know, that what, you know what encourages me out of that? Mary and Joseph are probably at one of the low points in their entire life. They're without. Joseph had to make a journey and he doesn't have work. They get there under the mandate of a cruel Roman government that carries, carries nothing for them with family quietly wondering how all this came about. They're the talk of those who don't hear God. And the fact of the matter is, when everything seems so desperately alone in their need, there is an entire legion of the hosts of heaven that surround everything connected. They were never alone for a second. Not one. No believer, my friend, no believer in Jesus is ever alone, no matter how dark the night seems to be. So it was when the angels had all gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with, with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. You notice it didn't say, and three wise guys. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known and saying, which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at the things which were told them by the shepherd. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, <clears throat> as it was told them. <clears throat> when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus. The name was given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. The angel told him, you name him Jehovah saves. You name him Joshua. That was Jesus' name, <coughs> Joshua. Now, when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to be presented to the Lord. <coughs> now, if you'll remember from our study of Leviticus, when a woman brought forth a male child there were 40 days of pur purification. When she brought forth a female char child, there was a penalty round, and she had 80 days. Okay? I'm not touching that with a 10-foot pole. <laughs> Circumcision of, chil of, of male children at eight years old, or eight years old, eight days old, was... Uh, considered to be so solemn an occasion that even if the child's birth fell on the Sabbath, they would make the journey 
and they would have the child circumcised. That was the one time where you were allowed to break the Sabbath. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now, if you will remember again from our study of Leviticus, God laid claim for his service to every firstborn in Israel, both animals and of human beings, okay? All the firstborn males. And then it, the, the law was interpreted in such a way that it was possible to buy a child out of that service, to redeem a child with a purchase. Keep that in mind, okay? Because that goes right into the concept of the kinsman redeemer. Then God selected for himself at the time of Moses the entire tribe of Levi instead of the firstborn again. The sacrifice that was required could be other animals that were expensive. But a family that was poor were able to offer two turtle doves or two pigeons. Why? Because in Israel, pigeons were everywhere. And it was very, very easy to catch pigeons, which meant that it was possible to meet the mandate of the law no matter what your economic state was. And because Joseph and Mary offered two turtle doves, two pigeons, for her uh, purification, it tells us that these were poor people. They were accustomed to the hard life. They were accustomed to the things that afflict the souls of men. They knew what it was to wonder where the next meal was coming from. They knew what it was for everybody to rejoice when there was an offer of work that was hard. They knew what it was to do what it was necessary to survive. They didn't come from a rich family. And, be, and behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, the Messiah. And the Holy, one, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. Now, what does that say about this man? He was living in a time when things were not kind of bad. They were bad. And he had reconciled within himself that his primary goal and duty was going to have his heart and mind set on the things of God and to trust him with all of his heart. So he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the Christ child, Christ Jesus, the child Jesus, to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all the peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. <coughs> You know what just happened? That man celebrated the birth of Jesus. And it wasn't about presents. It wasn't about Christmas trees. It wasn't about great food. You know what it was about? It triggered in the man great thankfulness to God for his faithfulness to do what he promised to do. That's what Christmas is all about. That's the purpose of it. And in Christians, it should trigger great thanksgiving. Because you know, folks, as surely as this is historically based, factual, as a matter of fact, those records I told you about that kept the census that Joseph and Mary were kept in still exist. As surely as this is true, all the rest of the book is true too. 
there's some things that are going to happen. There will be a one world government, despite anybody's efforts. There will be an economic system completely and totally controlled by that government. There will be a time when there will be that one world leader who will be considered all powerful and that the people will rejoice in because he will bring peace with an iron fist. Sound familiar? And the reality is believers are going to be taken home to be with Jesus and Jesus is going to return and he is going to establish his government for a thousand years. And for eternity we'll have that's one Paul's possible alternative the other God is not a dictator to make people come just because he desperately desires it it's a choice we choose whether or not to accept the gift of faith and grace that allows us to respond to a risen savior as much as I like Christmas, I'll tell you the real, the holiday that excites me the most, Easter. <laughs> Easter is the ultimate put up or shut up. But there's no Christmas without Easter. There's That's right. No, there's no manger without the cross. So That's right. So wow. Well, I know it's been an unusual Sunday, but Jesus is the reason for the season. If you take these facts, if you ever want to explain to people about Christmas, I recommend you get a copy of my notes. Because there are people who still believe that it's all a myth. And nothing could be further from the truth. Lord Jesus, we thank you humbly this, this afternoon for your word. Lord, thanks for coming. And thank you for coming again. Lord, we ask you to receive our worship and we just say happy birthday, Jesus, in your name. Amen.